What is up, everybody? Welcome to my show. With me today is a professional lawyer slash professional poker player slash professional whiskey drinker, Mr. Jared Smith, a.k.a. Smith 84 poker on Twitter. What is up, Jared? How are you? What's going on, Veronica? Not too much. I'm doing <laughs> pretty well. <laughs> I see you have some beautiful art behind you. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> the old, uh, the old... Uh, Kincaid Prince down here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So where are you right now? Because I, I am in uh, St. Louis, or just on the Illinois side of St. Louis, in a okay. in a dirty basement, uh, where I play poker. <laughs> you have basements out there. That's impressive. Uh, we do. I haven't no. seen a basement since I, since I moved to California. No earthquakes. Lots of tornadoes. <laughs> Sounds just like Canada. Ah. Not quite um, as cold most of the time. So I um, I sleuth, sleuthed through you and your stuff online, and I see uh, you have a lifetime uh, Hendon Mob live earnings of 272000 over 272000 and your biggest cash was last year's main event for just under sixty k, uh, and not 60 dimes. We're not going to say 60 dimes. <laughs> Careful, gotta be care- gotta be careful with that, or careful with gambling with people who would try to act like dime doesn't mean one k. Yeah, I see. I'm just like, I would just say a k. I don't know this whole controversy. This whole, yeah. What yeah, that, what do you say? You say a dime for ten. I, I mean, I mean, I don't know. No, a dime, a dime is one k, but I don't say it personally. But. Where, like that, where did that derive from? Is that like a drug dealer thing that is now used in poker? Where did, no, it, where did it come from? No, because like a, a dime bag is like $10. It was always like $10 worth of yeah. something. So that would be like, but that makes sense because dime, 10, whatever. But betting betting a dime on something in gambling has always been, as far as I've known, has always been a thousand. So that was like a really weird that was like a really weird and strange thing that I was like, how could you possibly think it was, especially cause the guy said 10 K in the first, like he said 10 K in the initial message and then was betting on the opposite side and said, okay, I'll do that for a dime. Like he wanted 10 K on that, but then he said a dime. I don't know. But I, I thought that was really odd that that was even a controversy at all. Um, well, you know, language is fluid and it could mean different things in different areas. And For sure. So uh, I kind of perused through your Twitter and <laughs> peruse being the proper term for peruse. I, I dug into your Twitter <laughs> and you have a love hate relationship with ACR. Are you are you playing right now, by the way? Uh, I have just a like I have like a global table up on the side that I had <laughs> earlier. I thought I thought it'd be over by now, but it's not. It's just like like ten big blinds, so quick decisions. But uh, yeah, that was not the uh, plan to be playing right now. But uh, yeah, so, I, so talk to me about a- ACR, and I want to hear uh, your your long term relationship with Poker Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, like. I don't, I don't, people, a lot of people in this jumped to the conclusion that I disliked ACR, um, which isn't true at all. Like I, I play ACR, you know, pretty frequently. There was about six or seven months when the software, they tried to update the software and they screwed it up so bad that it was unplayable. So I didn't play on it then. But like, otherwise, I mean, it's a good sign. It's got the it's got the highest guarantees and everything like that. Yeah, so. so they had this $33, 150K guarantee this weekend on Sunday, and then the site crashed. But I did hear that uh, they paid everyone their money back and ICM, right? So they took a they took a loss on that, did they not? Uh, no, they didn't. So they didn't pay. So their um, refund policy, which comes up constantly, because that's the number one biggest knock on ACR, uh, bots was historically a big thing. That's not so much of an issue anymore, but uh, the number one knock on ACR is that every time they have a big series, the site can't handle the traffic and uh, the whole site goes down. So we all kind of know their refund policy really well, uh, which is if the tournament is still in late reg, which those massive guaranteed ones are in late reg for five or six hours, actually, um, if it's still in late reg, 
and they cancel it, they just refund every single entry into it. Um, you know, everybody just, it's like it never happened. Everybody gets their money back. Even if you busted it five times and gave up, you still get all of those bullets back. And uh, that was, uh, so if it's, if it's switched over to running, but not in the money yet, so it's out of late range, they give everybody in the tournament that, that's still in the tournament at the time it crashes, they're buying back, and then they take all the rest of the money and chop it up and do a uh, do like a chip chop type ICM deal with it. Uh, so for several of those tournaments, they were already out of late reg. So like there was an eighty eight hundred k or eight you know, hundred twenty five k or something like that that was already out of late reg. So we got. Uh, chip chop for that but the uh the 3350k was still in late reg so it just everybody just got their money back for that one although that's that's kind of a point of contention too because uh everyone has not gotten all of their uh money back on all of those uh their site's a real big mess when it comes to like accounting so finding your transaction history, it's like a, a multi-page, like you have to tab through and all this stuff. And they've got the buy-in and the, uh, and the registration fee in two separate line items. So like you can imagine how, <laughs> like, like if you They're play caught. 30 tournaments on a Sunday, yeah, it's fucked. <laughs> Did all their tournaments crash on Sunday? Uh, yeah, everything, everything went down. So uh, Where's Joey Ingram when you need him? <laughs> not all of them. Not all of them had crashed actually. So uh, they were starting to freeze, and we could tell that that was going to happen. And then we went on break, uh, and it said, "You know, tournament will break will begin as soon as all tables are completed." And then that just never changed on almost any of them except for like a few random tournaments came back from break while all the rest of them did not, uh, which is kind of weird, but they ultimately, after it had been 30 minutes, they, by their terms of service, they have to cancel it. So they stopped, uh, then, and, uh, that's how like they tried to, they tried to restart it without doing a full server restart. They just tried to put up a bunch of new tournaments and start again. And then those crashed a few hours later. <laughs> so uh, try number three got through. Um, so there were still there were a few tournaments that happened on Sunday night, one of which I think went till seven or eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but yeah, it was a mess. So what is your history with Poker Pastor? And give us give us the whole story. Yeah. Um, so are you blocked over- currently? No, I'm unblocked, and okay. uh, he, he and I are actually going on uh, uh, Drew's tomorrow you're uh, doing stream a tomorrow. Stream, right? Drew, Drew, Drew's a mutual friend of both of ours and a pretty um, stand-up guy, I think, based to, to anybody in the poker world, Twitch world, Twitter world. So um, uh, there's not really that much history is the funny thing. So he and I are uh, – he and I have been friends. Uh, he stayed at my house – uh, for a series here, uh, they they were supposed to come for a few days. They ended up. He and a friend came down and uh, busted the first flight of it, and didn't. They were kind of tilted by it and ended up going home. But they, you know, stayed at my house that night and and everything. Like so, he's a he's a friend, and and I posted on uh, I think it was Saturday morning. I I posted. I I just I had this tweet composed for kind of a while but uh it had just gotten to be too much with like kind of the state of all of the um i call them shills and specifically the like super fake shills that are just like you know acr can do no wrong and it's not even acr specific it, they, they've been the biggest offenders or have been the the affiliates for acr about kind of acting like the site can do no wrong and shitting on other sites and everything like that. And it's just like really fake. It's very obvious that you have a vested monetary interest in this. And I just don't really like fake. When you say the shells, do you mean the people who are potentially sponsored by ACR and they're streaming and they're promoting and they're promoting on Twitter and ACR has three kind of different levels of 
whatever. So ACR has sponsored pros, um, which there's a few of. They announced a few more um, recently. That's Je Jeff Boski is a sponsored pro, and Tom Canuli. I think Michael is, Longcar is too, right? Longcar, Longcar now is that he's one of the ones that they announced. I think it was like very beginning of the year. Um, they announced Longcar, um, Poker Guru, I believe, is what he goes by online. I can't remember his real name. Um, and then uh, Brian uh, DePaulo, the um, degenerate, uh, gam degenerate gambler on YouTube. Um, and like those are all, I mean, I, I know, you know, I, I know some of those guys and like it, it's whatever. I don't, you know, I don't have a problem with, you know, being a sponsored pro for a site or anything like that. And those guys as much aren't really who I'm talking about. Then there's like a level down that's uh, what are called the ACR Stormers. That's the Twitch streamers that are part of, it's like a little stream team, but it's really there's zero barrier to entry into it. You, you fill out a form essentially and say you're going to stream on Twitch. And if you get certain, you meet certain requirements and do whatever, they give you buy-ins and various things like that. And I actually used to be a part of that uh, years ago, four or five years ago. Um, I was actually a part of that stream team. So, and then there's just the straight affiliate uh, who just did that. That's anybody literally, you know, you could have an affiliate link and you just send it to somebody. And if they sign up using your code and clear requirements, then you get money for it. I kind of feel like that those wouldn't fall under the shill requirement because there you would be, you're not understanding the connection to the person selling you, you know, this bad product. Right. They're, you, they're obviously connected to, um, ACR. Um, but I do think it's bad if there is something going on that's wrong, but they're in denial about it. Yeah. Of like, you and, know, and, and that's my, that's my ability. cheating and everyone saying, no, everything's good. He's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, the denial. I had to throw are, that in there. <laughs> you know, for sure. Like, any, any, any chance you get always. <laughs> not anymore. You, you, not no, so yeah. much anymore. I'm kind of yeah, getting over it. Yeah. But you earned it. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no, it's like, it's for me, I just want you to be honest. I don't care if you right. make money off of something. Like a lot of my good friends are uh, party poker pros now and like i don't have any sort of problem with that i think that party poker is putting out a good product and i think that they're kind of acting a lot like stars used to be they're, they're having some growing pains too and none of them like none of my friends that are party pros at least to my knowledge like that i have seen publicly on twitter on their twitch channels anything like that i haven't seen any of them throwing shit at other sites and saying like, oh, well, these sites are down yeah. too. Uh, saying like, you know, this is normal. It's not that big a deal. Like, don't get, you know, don't get bothered by it, blah, blah, blah. I mean, they just say like, hey, this sucks. You know, what do you do? <laughs> like, this is, we're, we're not happy too. Like, we're losing money as well. They're all professional poker players, right? They're profitable tournament players on the site. They've just sat there and wasted a bunch of their time on a Sunday so when those sites go down, it's bad for them too. And it's like, that's what I want. I want you to, you don't even have to say whatever, or just say nothing. Like you, you don't have to, <laughs> nobody's. I think it's, it's fine to objectively acknowledge something and yeah. to say it's not good, but still be supportive of the software. Sure. Of course. You don't have to do like what I, some, what, what I do in these situations is I just, you know, go for the memes. You blast like I, off on Twitter. Yeah, I go for the memes because that's that's on quote unquote brand for me. Not that I have like a, I'm not selling anything. I'm not like, you know, I'm not beholden to anybody. So it's like I can say that kind of stuff, and I do say that kind of stuff mostly just because it's funny. Like, I talk to Phil Nagy, the CEO of ACR, sometimes. Like, I like Phil. I think he's a really good guy. Um, I think he's got some pretty big flaws. I don't know that he should necessarily be the upfront public figure for a poker site. I mean, there's a lot of, but like, he is, he is himself. Like he's authentic in that regard for the most part. And so, you know, I don't, I don't mind that, but it's just like, 
uh, you know, I'm going to talk shit and say these things just because they're funny. Like, they're entertaining to me. And there's a lot of people that are really, really pissed off in those moments. So well, they, can yeah. come, they can come to my Twitter and, like, you know, goof about and talk shit in there. You know, you, I, you're talking shit, but, but at the same time, I mean, I believe in constructively talking shit. Right. I think, like, having uh, people uh, be accountable and having their businesses have accountability for things that may have gone wrong. I mean, it happens in my line of work all the time. I just sure. have to suck it up and, and uh, do better next time. Yeah, nobody um, likes that. Like, it's just part of life. Like, it's part of being an Software crashes. Adult. Shit happens. Yep. Um, your coders might have a really bad um, uh, process of storing the data uh, or naming the data or numbering it. And then you have two lines, one for, uh, like you said, your buy-in, you said there were like two separate lines. That yeah, it's like a line for the buy-in. So like if you buy into a 22, it's like $2 of rate. There's like a $20 line for the buy-in and then a $2 line for the Yeah, fee, yeah. So which it does make sense because if they need to, like one, it makes sense because, you know, one of those line items goes directly into the prize pool. One of them goes to the house. So that makes sense. And then it also makes sense because like um, they have done some, they're messing around with something where, like um, they're considering if even if a tournament is already into like a running state or in the money already, they're considering returning everybody that's out of the tournament's uh, fee. They're, they're, you know, $2 in rake in that mm -hmm. regard because they didn't put out a good product, you know, in that. Right. And, I, and I think that that's a good, you know, Phil has talked about that and he said that. And I think that that's a good, I think that's a good gesture of goodwill to say like, look, even though you were out of the tournament and it was already in the money, like you weren't getting back into that, your money was gone, but we're still going to give you the $2 back because, you know, we put out a shitty product on this day. And so that's how we're going to fix it. And like, I think you'd get a lot of goodwill with that. So. But. Yeah. And I think people would probably appreciate if, uh, like you said, the shells were, more honest and objective with everything because we can objectively see that the shit's crashing all day on yeah. Sunday and people are wasting time. Yeah. So, so yeah, but anyway, I, so I put out that tweet because I was just kind of, I was in Milwaukee. Actually, I was, I was getting ready to go play the uh, circuit main at Potawatomi and I just like put out that tweet and shit just kind of blew up. Um, you know, it, it mostly blew up and people, a lot of people agreeing with me because, you know, they've seen that kind of thing and they're sort of fed up with it too. Um, I got a lot of like private messages that were like, uh, like, like kind of like you went there type thing, whatever. And then, uh, you know, one of the responses to that was from, was from Poker Pastor. You know, he re he replied to it. He, he took offense to sort of what I said, um, felt it was, you know, aimed at him, and, you know, and it was, it was aimed at people doing a certain thing in general, you know, it wasn't aimed at anybody specifically, if it was, you know, I would either talk to that person or call them out specifically, but it was just, it's just the state of U.S. facing poker right now, in my opinion, um, and so that's kind of why I said it and whatever, and there was some back and forth that resulted in, um, uh, you know, him blocking me on Twitter and I, I'm an asshole. So I, you know, then took that, like, I, I, I just kind of went off from there and, and, and that's, you know, I would I, say you're I, a nice guy with a lot of asshole tendencies. Yeah. I, like I said, I'm, I'm not, I'm not like, I, I needle for sure. And like when something gets, when something, uh, my, my thoughts kind of on the whole thing are like, if the shoe fits, wear it, like if, if it's not true, you shouldn't get defensive about it, especially because I didn't call you out specifically. Um, and I've since had a few people show up in my, you know, responses, like also thinking that I was talking about them specifically. And like a couple of them are, are people that I don't even know. And I, I've literally said like, dude, I couldn't, I couldn't be talking about you because I don't know who the hell you are. Like it's, it's I, I don't. So, you know, there's, there's whatever. But I do think that if a general statement offends you so deeply, maybe you need to like look at yourself and think, Hey, is, is this, uh, <laughs> you know, is this something 
about me? Is there something about is me? There is there some reason that I, is there some reason that I identify as this, right? Right. It was like, if somebody said something like that to me, if somebody called me a shill and, and said like, I'm, you know, I'm being fake and promoting all these websites, I would just laugh. There's no, it's so unfounded and so, you know, wildly inaccurate that it's just not. I kind of totally get that for some yeah. reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So you're, you're kind of, uh, if anyone follows the both of us on Twitter, I give you a lot, uh, I give you a quite a, quite a hard time for like always making final tables and never really quite getting there. You're like a middle-aged woman that goes on a lot of bad dates. You never quite get there. You know, yeah. you're, you're getting, I saw you got a few firsts, but you're always like, you got second in the tag team event this past year at the World Series of Poker. And my heart breaks every time you post a final table because I'm like, <laughs> why are you even posting this final table? You know you're not going to get first. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, you, I got to so, give, give the people what they want. Though, so. The real question is, why'd you leave law then? <laughs> ah, so, funny. like, what happened? You're a lawyer. Um, what happened to that? Why, why poker now? Especially poker being, I think, as difficult as it is nowadays. Um, yeah, that was sort of a, it was a pretty organic, uh, type thing. Uh, I ended up like, I started playing online poker more, actually really started playing online poker when I was in law school, kind of something to like pass the time and, and do whatever in between, you know, it was kind of a stre good stress reliever and everything like that. And then I started streaming on Twitch kind of recreationally. I believe that was during law school. And just had a lot of fun with it, but I was totally playing recreationally. Um, when I got out, I, I never really, um, as you can maybe see from my Twitter, I don't always play well with others. So um, I was never really somebody that was probably going to go work for anybody. Uh, so I mostly practiced. Uh, I pretty much had private practice and found my own clients and did everything that way. So I worked for myself. So I could kind of set my own hours that ended up being uh, kind of conducive to playing poker. So I could get up in the morning, go play a local like daily tournament or something like that. And then when I got done, do some work. And I kind of set it up to where I could spend half my time being a lawyer and half my time playing poker. Uh, and then I ultimately you know, kind of enjoyed poker a lot more than the uh, legal side of things. So I just sort of made the switch to playing full time, just kind of see how it works out. And like you said, yeah, it is a lot tougher, but I enjoy the challenge aspect of it. And I'm not really super money motivated. Like I said, I was never going to go work for a big law firm or do anything like that. So it just kind of fit my lifestyle pretty so what's, well. What's your main motivation? Um, I think it's enjoying my time for the most part. So if I can, you know, if I can spend most of my time playing poker, whether it's online or live, I do a pretty good mix of both. Uh, that's kind of a win for me. So I could make half the money that I would make as a lawyer, let's say, and, you know, have enjoyed the way that I spent my year you know, so much more, that's a much bigger win for me than going and kind of selling my soul, so to speak, to do something I'm not really happy with. I feel exactly the same way. I feel that way about my job right now. Mm -hmm. My brain, I always tell people my brain enjoys my job. And if you offered me double to go somewhere else to maybe do a more task oriented job or lose some autonomy or like be micromanaged, I would be so miserable and it wouldn't be worth the money. It just wouldn't be worth the money, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so like there's – there's if people only look at monetary gain as your only EV, then you're missing out on a lot of life. Like of course you need to pay your bills. Like you can't – you can't like – I don't know if you can do it on minimum wage, but you know, you have to get to a point where you're – making a decent living, paying your bills, being able to do the things that you want to do. And then you need to find that fulfillment. Yeah. Um, so you're, tr do you travel the circuit? I notice you're on, uh, the world series of poker. Um, you've got your listings on there I on top of Hendon mob. Are you traveling a lot? 
Yeah, um, kind of, so basically, uh, kind of the goal is travel to anything that's valuable. So I'm in St. Louis, so pretty much anything that's within about a five hour drive uh, is what and that's, I try that's to, what you mean by valuable five hour drive uh par partially that um valuable gonna be relatively inexpensive that's pretty much all of the midwest uh, are saying. you looking for guarantees or low rake or like what's what like i'm trying to define more what valuable is it, it kind of just depends so it, it's uh what i'm looking for might change based on what the stop is so if if there's a stop that's maybe going to be a little bit like worse monetary value either higher rate like the wsop circuit stuff is not good monetary value now that's 15 percent payouts and they rake the shit out of everything uh particularly because they take money for the global casino championship thing that i already have a seat in so it's like i'm i'm really wasting money uh playing those so it ends up that those are very soft and there are a lot of them nearby. So I end up playing them some of the time, but like if I've got friends that are traveling to those cause they need circuit points and stuff like that, that's more valuable to me say than you know, going somewhere that's going to have like lower rate, better guarantees or whatever. Cause again, it comes down to kind of the time thing, right? I'd rather enjoy my time spent doing whatever. I could definitely do a lot better job of selecting what tournament series to go to and everything like that but that will change actually uh in may um, i already uh, kind of lived in the summer i've lived in vegas in the summer but uh we're actually moving to vegas in may so oh permanently uh, permanently yeah for at least oh, a good. year so, for, for at least a year so i'll have somewhere to stop and get a free meal before yeah, i sure. go play the ladies event and hopefully get to the final table this year and get uh what would you get sixth I got 13th. Oh, 13th. <laughs> I, I had, hate uh, you, Lexi. <laughs> I was on, yeah, I was on, uh, I was on break and I like, I like walked over there and then you would, I think you had just busted or something. And so you looked pissed off and I was just like, yeah, uh, okay. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just gonna walk. I was like, I was almost in tears and yeah. I think I might have cried in the car on the way back to where I was staying. Yeah, I, I, mean, was, are, it, I just are... took like three massive hits uh i don't want to get into it but you know like no one wants to hear a bad beat story but no it's not that but i i, I totally get it like you said you gave the uh i'm i'm a middle-aged woman that's going on a lot of bad dates here and and not really finding my prince charming for sure because i both i definitely that have middle-aged woman <laughs> that, i definitely i definitely have the pain thing down for sure i mean i i just uh you know watch. you know uh, now I'm realizing that pain equals fulfillment. Yeah, Choctaw was uh, Choctaw was uh, in Oklahoma, right on the border of uh, Texas. Is uh, the series that was at the beginning of the year, and it's it was probably the most painful and brutal series that I've ever had. I mean, I was down, I was down five figures before the main started, which is pretty tough to do with a bunch of like $400 buy-ins and actually their opening event was a $250 buy-in. It was, uh, it was pretty brutal and pretty incredible. And I was like 90% positive. I was going to just save the whole series in the main. Um, cause I, you know, was like 35 people left and, and had a pretty good stack and flop top set on a dry board and the guy was just barreling into me and so I was just like positive and I ended up losing that hand in a kind of miraculous way and and was just like pretty shocked by it <laughs> like after it happened I was just like I couldn't even believe it. that that place that place was really really bad to me uh incredibly soft soft poker which makes it even like makes it feel even worse because it's one thing if you're just getting outplayed, you're like, oh, wow, I sh shouldn't come back here. But when they're just, uh, they're just really, uh, Greg Jennings put it a great way, uh, um, creative gameplay <laughs> is what he referred to it as, is, is why that's his favorite so, stop. So that yeah, um, I actually uh, interviewed my friend Adam, who's um, a high stakes cash game player out here. And he talks <laughs> about the lower stakes, like not playing gto versus these lower players because of this creative stuff do you find the same thing like do you change adjust for the bigger buy-ins or player pool yeah yeah i mean there's there's a 
there's a really big element of sort of like they always have it in some spots where you know you, you can think you know if if you're used to playing against regs or online various things like that you can think like okay well they could have some bluffs here and whatever and then just like you can kind of like look across the table and this dude is 65 years old and he hasn't played a hand in an hour like he doesn't have any bluffs here and stop trying yeah. to convince yourself that he does you're just being an idiot like you can justify it later however you want to but you, you kind of have to have some element of just laugh at yourself like laugh at the fact that you're in this spot and this dude is just telling you very obviously that he has the nuts and you just have to make that ridiculous lay down some of the time and everything like that but yeah that's 100 percent true you can't you can't really um but yeah in in the mains um which are usually depending on whether it's hpt or wsop circuit they're either like 1650s or 1700s in these series there's like there's a lot more good pros that fly in just for that and everything like that and you either know those guys already or you, you can just tell pretty quickly just based on how they play so the ones that really throw you for a loop are are when it's like you know this late 50s guy and whatever and you have sort of a stereotype in your head and all of a sudden they do something and you're just like taken aback by it. like all right you can't you can't bank on that sort of thing but you know sort of guilty until proven otherwise is for sure the um <laughs> definitely the strategy there so um what's your favorite place to play um i like um i like playing at the win in vegas which will actually the encore but uh hashtag standard uh i i think everybody i've ever talked to is like yeah win's my favorite it's yeah pretty much my favorite they're the only one during the summer that runs like mixed games and i'll just tweet at them and they'll respond and get the table ready they're amazing it's hard, it's hard to not it it really is hard to not have them be your favorite place but like you it's pretty straight it's pretty strange to me to hear anybody say that their favorite place to play in vegas is anywhere but the win but yeah that's definitely uh that's definitely up there as far as like uh, i i do enjoy playing um at the two local casinos that are here um so if uh do, we actually start start a series tomorrow hpt starts at a uh, hollywood casino in, in uh, uh west county in st louis uh, that starts tomorrow, and so I'll be playing that all week. And then actually just right after that is another WSOP circuit uh, coming, and that comes goes to the casino, which is literally five minutes away from that one. We have the so, same thing. We have Matrix and Bay, like, literally nice. across the street from each other. Yeah, they're on the same – they have to be in, – in Missouri, they have to be a boat. So, you know, they've, they've built these buildings on the on the river, and they just, like, with, with just enough – water underneath it for it to technically qualify as a boat so they're on different they're on opposite sides of ones in Mer hollywood's in maryland heights and uh ameristar's in st charles but they're literally on opposite sides of the same river they're both on the missouri river so so i wanted to go back to the win because um you can't just say it's just the customer service and i know you you play tournaments yeah. uh is their structure better than other people uh, their structure is actually, for some of their tournaments, actually their structure is a little bit worse. Uh, I would say that Venetian structures are usually better, in my opinion. Um, they take, win takes less rake, although they do one thing. The only thing that I don't love that they do is they kind of hide the uh, staff fee. Or they, they sort of bury it a little bit. They take basically 10% rake for like... The like win buries it? Yeah, the win kind of buries it. So if you play a 550 at the win, it's 500 plus 50. But they take something like 2% out for the dealers or whatever they take out, and that comes out from the 500. So it's not it's not part of that 50. Oh. Yeah, it's it's a little – they kind of bury the lead on it a bit. Whereas, like, I, I would much prefer if it said, you know, 490, 490 – plus 10 plus 50 or you know what however yeah, they yeah. do it or they do it three numbers like that or just or just include <coughs> in just include that in there that that would be my strong preference there but it's kind of like 
I, I don't, I understand why the, it's, it's on the bottom of the sheet and it says it and everything like that, but it, it's still the lowest rate. Like even with that, it's still the lowest rate in Vegas of all of the casinos. So that's better. It's just a comfortable place to play. Um, you know, the, cha- right next the to chairs the- are nice. It's right next on, to the Encore pool, Beach Club, the, the beach Encore club, beach and you club. can see all the girls walking by. All the by. girls walking by in the summer. It's a, it's a really, <laughs> truly miraculous place. It's a little hard Don't to Don't get me wrong. Guys by. walk by too, you know? Right, I, for sure. I enjoy the view. Yeah. And uh, it's just kind of like, it's just a, it's just a nice casino, kind of, you know, more upscale, um, upscale clientele and everything like that. It's just a just a better place to play. Plus, they have uh, trophies that are building that are the shape of the building, which like I is actually, probably the coolest thing of all time. It is the coolest thing of all time. I actually think that every single casino should get a building trophy. So and you I can also make the think whole the strip. I, I have the said this. Whole, I want the whole strip. Can you yep. imagine how amazing that would be? And then uh, I really think that the win should do like for the smaller daily buy-ins, just like a little. Just a little, a little bit, like a keychain, like a keychain like building. Key yeah, and, key then, and then, like you can, you can like throw your rank around. Like uh, here on my shelf is the big building, and then yeah. like your buddy's got the smaller one, and like they I don't do know. Have, I think it would... they do have different size ones. They just don't for like the smaller daily ones like that. But they do have Give so us a keychain. <laughs> so they have like for when they run a series, there's three the the multi flight ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, the multi-flight ones are always a bigger trophy, and then those single-day ones are a smaller trophy. And those suckers are actually heavy. I don't know if you've ever held one of those. No, they're like, no. They're like really, really heavy, and they're uh, yeah, they're they're solid for sure. Yeah, we need to get all the casinos to get those because if we could make the strip, that would be so dope. Yeah, that would be that, so dope. I, I, I'm 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 max firing at Planet Hollywood, like the worst place on earth to play poker. I would be max firing just to get just to get the pH. Uh, <laughs> I would have never I would have never chopped that Planet Hollywood tournament if there was a trophy up top. Uh, so why do you consider? I have my own reasons why I don't like playing there. What are your reasons? I mean, I I do actually play there. Um, I. My biggest win before the very end of the summer was a four-way chop at Planet Hollywood. Kind of, I ended up there sort of by accident. But it's the the biggest reason to not play there is that the uh, is that the dealers are just the absolute worst. They're the bottom of the barrel. Like half of them have never dealt poker before. The hopefully they're the, not dealing PLO or split pot games. They do. They they don't mostly hold those there they kind of know whatever and and then for like the main and stuff they try to sort of weed out the the shittier ones uh but they're actually they're 1700 dollars main at the end of uh at the end of it's right before the uh the wsop main and it's actually a pretty tough tournament surprisingly enough like it's it's one of the tougher random 1700s in the summer just because of its proximity to the main and the fact that you know, everybody's already in town. They're like, oh, I'll just go flick it in over here. But, um, but yeah, it's it's just they charge a ton of rake. They're, um, you know, they're – and I'm, I don't want to – I'm good friends with a few of the floors over there, and they're doing the best they can with what they have. Um, actually one of the, one of my favorite floors in the world. Um, I don't know if you know who, uh, Roz was, she recently passed away, actually kind of a huge surprise. I think um, I saw her picture on Twitter. When yeah, she she, that was, away. that was like a, a huge surprise and like a huge blow to the poker community. Cause like anybody that's ever met her, she's just like, she was the most like professional while being one of the biggest badasses that you would ever talk to in your life. She, she's one of those people that could just kind of like turn and look at you and, and like snap you into action of like whatever the hell you were doing that you weren't supposed to be doing type thing. Like a, like a really, really amazing floor. And she was a floor there. And I like, I would talk to her some of the time and tell her some of the things going on and she would just kind of lose her shit over it and go like immediately try to fix and do whatever. But her and, and Luis, um, who's a, he floors a bunch of different, but they're both floors over there. And a good friend of mine, Bobby, uh, was flooring, I believe, for the first time this summer. Like they were doing the best they could with what they had, but 
the problem is everybody wants all these tourneys with amazing structures and so many of them and there's you know seven different casinos running series and it's like okay there's only so many dealers and Venetian and the win pay better and give you better hours and everything like that so automatically the best dealers are going to be over there in the first place and then you know there's like the WSOP faithful that are really good dealers the traveling circuit dealers for WSOP are great they pretty much all deal for WSOP in the summer they're very good but there's only so many of them and when you're running a tournament that's got 10,000 runners in it you need a hell of a lot more dealers so you're getting people that have you know just need a job and so there's just there's an under there's not enough supply to meet the demand in the summer so you end up someplace has to suffer and that used to be i would say golden nugget kind of used to be that and they've kind of stepped their game up a bit they've gotten a lot better yeah so I had there's still some bad ones there's still some one bad of the ones. most egregious things a dealer did was in a, <laughs> in a omaha eight tournament there that i was in and i was in the hand and the dealer like on the river he's like well there's no low in this one so i'm just gonna put the pot together and i was like what are you doing he doesn't know that like <laughs> What the fuck are you saying? You're, and you're and you're playing like a hundred and fifty dollar PLO eight <laughs> tournament probably. The guy's <laughs> like, uh, what's a low? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's pretty bad. Yeah, it uh, was bad. I I I was like, I knew he didn't know. I told him yeah. after the hand, I'm like, you can't say that. And he's like, oh, sorry. But it, you know, like stuff like that is like really obviously bad. Yeah, of course. And it's gonna happen. And it is what it is. But like. It happens at certain places a lot more than others, and there's, you know, we, we kind of all know what those places are that are going to be that way, so it's, you know, and, and Planet Hollywood, unfortunately, is guilty of that, but I actually ended up at Planet Hollywood um, in the tournament that I chopped, like I said, sort of by accident. It was Big 50 weekend, mm-hmm. and you couldn't get anywhere near uh, the Rio. <laughs> Big 50 was sold out on that Sunday. It was yeah. like It was, like, super sold out. And that spillover, because everybody that plays poker came to Vegas that weekend, so that spilled over everywhere else. So we went to Venetian to try and play there. They said it was going to be a two-hour wait, and it was already a couple hours into the tournament. So I called my buddy that was a floor over at PH and was like, is there a wait list? He said, there's a long line at registration, but there's no wait list for tables. So I was like, okay, cool, we're diamond. So ran over there. And could, there's a diamond registration line just skip all of it so i went straight up to the diamond registration line jumped right in and they had it was just a 260 260 buy-in 50k guaranteed one day tournament and it ended up getting over 150k in it so by 6 30 in the morning it's, it's a one day structure but it got triple the runners they were expecting so yeah. so 6 30 in the morning we're still four-handed and uh three of us were very drunk <laughs> and we were just like <laughs> We were dead even. It was, it was, there was no sign of this tournament ever ending. I was just like, do you guys want to just chop it uh, four ways? It'll be second place money. And they're like, everyone just kind of looked and they're like, yeah, let's do it. So we <laughs> managed to get the hell out of there finally. Because it's like you still have to do tax paperwork and everything. Yeah. And we're all four going to have to do tax paperwork. So it's going to take forever to get out of there still. I find Planet Hollywood to be one of the loudest – and well bellagio i think is like the smokiest and the most cramped but planet hollywood's like i just it tilts me to play there i just can't can't concentrate so it's not loud upstairs or not nearly as loud upstairs where they run the tournaments oh Um, okay i played up there for a charity event i didn't know they actually had the tournaments up there that's that's exactly where the where the charity events are that's exactly where they have the tournaments so it's not down on the casino floor where their cash room is they're as far as low stakes like one two i think yeah they're one two as far as like one two cash games are concerned there is no better place to play in vegas than planet hollywood as far as just you get you just get the it's the softest that there is because you have to do de- because a lot of the regs won't deal with the like the things you're talking about it's so loud it's there's smoking at the pit right next to there but like all those things create for a party atmosphere drunk like tourists are are in the pits there's a blackjack yeah. table you could you could you could throw a chip 
and hit the blackjack table like from from your table there and it's like they're just walking by they're like oh what's this hold them oh i know how to play hold them like you know yeah how, what's the buy-in two hundred dollars okay cool and they just dust it off so fast so it's an amazing place to pick off the like cheap easy money if you can those are the only with. people i can still beat <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I, f- I feel that way. And I actually, some of the time, can't even beat them. So then you feel real fucking bad. But See, because I don't play GTO? <laughs> Completely uh, yeah. exploitative. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, so what, uh, what are your thoughts about this GTO controversy where it's ruined poker? I mean, I think that live poker is always going to be safe. Um, I think that online poker is in a real bad place right now for a lot of reasons and that is that is one of them but the biggest thing that the the whole gto you know gto robots everybody's you know just tanking exactly 48 seconds before three betting to you know this sizing and doing whatever that whole perception is hurting live poker more than the actual like play itself is hurting it i would say because like if you're there's something about when you're sitting there playing live even if it's somebody that has spent hours and hours running sims and doing all this whatever like that you're, you're still you're still sitting right across from them. you you can see that you can see they don't have any software up. It's their brain versus your brain and all this stuff. And they may be more prepared for this moment, but you don't feel as outmatched. And there's also, there's always, there's a, uh, if you're on the flop or the turn, there's more cards to come. <laughs> you know, you can, you can get bailed out. There's, there's just so much to it. That's like, you know, the recreational players, that's what they like about poker i mean they like the fact that they don't like when their aces get cracked but they like the fact that when they get eights in versus aces they can hit an eight and they still get some of them they like that they you know they like i said so it's like there's there's sort of i don't think it's gonna ruin live poker very much because at all these especially these midwest stops i still see these people doing things that are even in the, even in the mains, even in the seventeen hundred dollar buy-ins, I still see people doing things that are just so far out of line because they're because that's their entertainment. They're here to have fun, and that's whatever. Right, and I think like a lot of people don't realize. Um, and I was telling this to this journalist who was asking me. It was like a Mike Postel story, but he was asking me about. He didn't understand how the game ch- has changed and the progression. And I, I basically said like the best players 10 years ago were not nearly as sophisticated as the best players now. And if they didn't keep up with studying, they're probably a losing player now Mm -hmm. if they, you know, if we kept them at the same level. And, um, but I would say that live players, if they're going to go pro or if they are um, playing, trying to play pro, I don't think they realize how much study is involved and, Um, you can't have your solver in front of you or run Sims in front of like you actually will have to memorize your, you know, uh, your ranges. And um, I mean, and that's what, that's what I, that's what I like. It's less a lot robotic, of, I think. For sure. And that's what I like a lot about playing online poker is a, a lot of that for me is um, a lot of that for me is, is study time, so to speak, where you're like the actual play studying by playing isn't really a good strategy but i think that studying by playing online for playing live can be kind of a good strategy to some extent especially if like i said if you're playing low stakes live tournaments you you can get a little bit of that just by so i think that let me ask you like what what, give me the percentage breakdown of what you think is a good amount like percentage of studying versus play because I think like studying without play is not good and playing without studying is not good, but you need to, what's sure. your, what's your rank balance? I think that, uh, I think that somewhere around, if you can put in about 20, 20% of the, um, study time, uh, as, as 20% of the time you play into, stu- so, into studying, I think that that would be a good, a good breakdown so for most people. I think, 
here's what I, why I think like live play is still safe because not only are people not studying, if they are, there's so much bad information out there that it's deceiving and it's really hard to decipher what's good and correct and what's bad. The, and I think the reason why is we have positive reinforcement for bad decisions a lot of the time in poker. Your Definitely. brain confuses a lot of the information that you're getting. And I think like we're instinctually programmed to react to certain things like emotionally in our normal lives. Yeah. And um, we have to like force ourselves to, you know, change the way we're reacting to situations. But it's, I think, 10x harder to change your reaction to something when you're being positively reinforced to your yeah. bad, for your bad behavior. Not being results oriented is such a difficult thing to do. I mean, there, there's, there are some times that even I'm just like, got like, I can't, I can't beat these guys. Like I can't, they're, they're doing these things that I know instinctively are terrible, but I can't beat it. So it's like, you know, in some short run, whatever, I can't beat this at all. But and it so can't go, be a short, you can't think about it in a short term at all. Right. It's right. going to be, a, you got to look at your graph long term. Yeah, but like how much, but, but how, but how much, how, how short a term before something starts to feel like long term, right? If you're playing 30 or 40 tournaments a day, a three week stretch of just getting shit on can feel like long term, even though that's really not much of a sample size at all. It's so much more than a sample size, like of live play or something like that. Do you, do you, um, cause you're playing online and live, like, what do you consider a sample size? Like, do you look at your hands played or do you look at hours you've put in? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I, I look more at, in general, like online, I look at hands played. Like I, I try to, I try to sort of focus on like, uh, all in adjusted big blinds per 100 is sort of a mm -hmm. big one for me. So every day, like it doesn't mean anything really, but it, it does feel good at the end of the day when I have a positive, uh, when I have a decently positive all adjusted big blinds per 100. And then as you start to get out to like a week or like, you know, a year sample size on that, like then all of a sudden you're like, okay, I know I'm beating the game. In tournaments, it's a little bit trickier because like how much are you beating the game if you're winning at seven or eight big blinds per 100? There's so much more that goes into that. Like obviously uh, ICM stuff and like, times that you want really uh something you can't control at all but like a 10 big blind flip is not they're not all created equally right a 10 big blind flip you know an hour before the money is not the same thing as a 10 big blind flip on the final table bubble when average stack is 15 big blinds right. it's just like that can that can make such a huge difference in you know and, and there's there's a bunch of there's a bunch of random spots and everything from last year. You know, I had decent success last year live and there's a bunch of spots that I look back at and I think, man, if I didn't win that spot, like my whole year was different. And then there's a bunch of spots that I look back at and say, man, if I did win that spot, my whole year is so much better. I mean, I played a, I played a pretty crazy hand on day five of the main and I was probably, I was probably a top 10 stack at that point on day five of the main. And I, uh, played a massive pot with somebody else that had a had a similarly large uh, stack, and it was just like it was just like a spot where I flopped top pair with a flush draw and got check raised by the big blind, and he had you know top and bottom pair, and I didn't improve, and it just you know it just ended up being such a massive spot for so much of my stack, and if that you know. The, and I, I, like I said, I, I had so many, I, I was, we were basically a flip on the, on the flop in that hand. And if I improve in that hand, all of a sudden, you know, do I make day seven, day eight of the main? Like all of a sudden, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you know, I, I want a massive, I want a massive flip right in the money on day four to even be in that spot in the first place. So it's just kind of like, it, it's hard to, it's hard to figure out what's a good sample size and what's not in tournaments because your whole life changes or at least your whole year changes in particular. It, it, it can be your life like in the main, but your whole year changes on a few spots. 
like your entire year hinges on that. And it's, uh, <laughs> it can be a frustrating gig. That's why it's a grind, but at the same time, there's, there's some really, really high equity random spots in there. So you said that you, these spots are like kind of not life changing, but like they're year, year changing. changing, they're year changing for sure. And so how do you, how do you deal with these, like these, like, bad beats or these spots where you know you're a favorite and then it just kind of lo you lose that momentum because in a tournament i feel like you're you're slowly gaining momentum but you could at any time just fall off a fucking cliff right um so how do you deal with that like how do you mentally prepare first of all for a such a long tournament and then dealing with the rip of your chips bourbon mostly <laughs> um it it kind of it it's been sort of a, uh that's kind of gone up and down a lot for me how i deal with it and how well i deal with it and everything like that i uh i some sometimes i just kind of go completely zen about it like all right well that's the deal that's what you signed up for um you know there's a there's a little bit of that gut punch feel that you get that that's just not going to, you know, when you see that two outer drop on the river, you know, for Chipley, and the, there's some element of that that's just never going to go away. And I don't want that to go away. Right. Because that takes the fun out of it. If you're just robotic and you don't have any emotions and everything like that, you know, the day I stop completely caring about, the result, whether I win or lose or whatever, if I'm deep in a tournament, you know, then that takes some of the fun away <laughs> from it. But at the same time, if I'm, sometimes I find myself living and dying by every single run out and I'm like, I'll stop. And this happens particularly online when you go through like a really bad stretch where it's a lot of hands in a row and you just lose a bunch of flips and I'll just get in like ace king versus sevens and, like flop an ace and they river a seven and, and find myself just like losing it over that spot. And those are the times when I kind of try to t t step back and go like, all right, this is just some standard flip that you lost. Like you can't be like that. So I actually, I was having like a pretty bad run, you know, Choctaw happened and then I was playing online and had a really, really bad run online to, to start the year off basically. And I, I definitely, was feeling really down about that and then i found myself really really living and dying by runouts so i i made a i actually woke up one morning and like waited to start and just kind of it wasn't meditating it was sort of just sitting there having a chat with myself and i was like all right this is the only goal of the day is to not uh focus on runouts at all like not worry about them at all and of course like the universe sees fit to not test me on that day when I make that decision. I, I sun ran that particular day. Like I, I was like, but, but I was very much like focused on that. So then the next day I was like, okay, same thing, like whatever. So I, I've sort of lately very much been Zen about those things and they haven't bothered me at all. So it's, for me, it's a constant reminder. It just becomes a lot trickier when all of a sudden you're on a, you know, X number of dollars, buy-ins, whatever, downswing, and you go look at your account balance and it's not as much as it was and everything. But a lot of that can be resolved by just like playing within your bankroll, mm -hmm. selling if you need to sell action and doing stuff like that. So kind of a long-winded way of saying I deal with it in different ways, but mm -hmm. for me in particular, I think that like ta uh, taking pride in the mental fortitude that it takes to stay calm about those things like finding pride in that and then using that as my motivation has been the thing that's worked the best for me i find that like a, a lot of the stoicism that is prominent in higher end poker players yeah um comes off bad it comes off as bad tv it comes not just bad tv but i I have seen it kind of um, overflow into other parts of their lives. And I understand, you know, you don't want to be too attached to the money because you're using it kind of like a tool. 
But at the same time, uh, I often, I've tried to include more stoicism into my life, but then often I'm faced with situations like, you know, I'm a human, I'm dynamic, I'm, I have emotions. I and, need some emotion here too. Like I, yeah, and I, I, it's, it's I, a pro, not a con. I don't want to be a third, uh, third person, like watching myself do something. I want to be actively involved. And there are times where I feel like I need to process my emotions and, uh, the stoicism I find to be difficult. Although I would say like, it's good to not be like an emotional, like fucking going ape shit for everything. Cause I've seen people do that too. And that stop throwing shit at each other. Yeah, I, I joke with my family a lot that I'm like cold and dead inside because I, I, I am. There is a lot of that. I, I am. I was cold on, and dead inside before poker. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just like, and I and I was too to some extent. I'm just like I'm mostly unfazed by a lot of things, and so I think. Yeah, that, I mean, I just think that there's like there needs to be a balance. Like you don't want to be too far out on either end, you know. Yeah. It's, you still yeah. want to be human. You still like. Some something has to have meaning to you. Like at some amount of money has to have meaning to you. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm always. Uh, yeah, I, I'm actually like to a point sometimes to like I said to to my friends and family. Sometimes I'm like annoyingly uh, zen about certain things or whatever. Like my my sort of my sort of phrase on my ideology, if you will, or whatever, has for a long time been well everything always works out in the end and like it always has up to this point. Right. And so I just assume that everything kind of always will work out to the end. It doesn't mean you don't need to put yourself in good situations or good positions to succeed and whatever. And there well, yeah, can be, you just aren't results oriented, right? You just, sure. All you can that, do is set yourself up. All right. And that's why, that's why like poker is good for me. Poker works well for me because for the most part, other than those, those, times of weakness when it all sort of bubbles up and usually there's something else going on in your life like it's kind of going bad or whatever or like you might not be you know just you know you might not have gone outside for a while i find that it's just considering i play a lot of online poker or something like kind of you know especially in the winter here it's tough to it's tough to go outside a bunch when i'm not leaving <laughs> for for tournament series and everything like that so it's like man uh you know, have I have I been outside in the last six hours? Like maybe just go outside and get some fresh air, various things like that. I'd love but to see what your vitamin D levels are right now. Yeah, probably not great. I do actually take vitamin D supplements because of that, particularly in the winter here. But it's it's a fat soluble vitamin. Make sure you're eating something with it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, for sure. It's like it, I don't know. There is, it, but I think you are right though that that for some of those guys that it does spill over into other aspects and it, it's not a it's not like necessarily a terrible way to live so to speak it's not like you don't get happy about things it's just that you don't yeah. you don't uh you don't take the swings as much i mean i have good friends that just i have good friends that take that swing so far with everything that their highs are the highest highs their lows are the lowest lows and they're, they're just constantly on a roller coaster. they might be bipolar so just <laughs> yeah it's, <laughs> it's it's not really that it's not really to that extent so much but it is at the same time they're just they're very they're very attached to the now if you will i guess is, is probably the best way that i could put it sort of they're just they're living and dying by what's going on right now so i um the, with the stoicism and and um, kind of the talk about uh, using money, poker players, it seems like you use money as a tool. You're, you know, either buying into a tournament with your toolbox we call, or- We call them bullets, bullets for a reason. It's just ammunition. Right, right. Right. Yeah. So I grew up actually really poor and my parents pinched pennies and I rightfully so uh, uh, they, you know, when we immigrated, they were working minimum wage jobs and they had no money, but they also, even when they started having money, they're still, you know, they'd rather um, do like three flight hops and take 12 hours to get to the vacation destination it, to save like a hundred dollars rather than going on a direct flight. And yep. it really frustrated me growing up. And, um, I know like I have a, I'm in a position in life where I'm doing okay and I can take the direct flight, but it's also like, 
I, a poker appealed to me early on because I really hated their, like the, the fixation on every single penny. And I liked, uh, removing its, not its value, but you know what I mean? Like how you convert, str- you convert its value to something else. Right. right if right. you buy and into it, a tournament for $400, all of a sudden you get chips for that. Even cash games, you get chips. chips You're not yeah. playing with cash and, on the table. And it's like, it's your tool and you're investing in, you know, you're trying to grow your tool. And so like, uh, that came off. I was, I was going to leave, I was going to leave that one alone shockingly, but. No, but you're like, so you're trying to get this stack to grow. And so like, I don't, I, I, I really, that appealed to me. That was like the number one thing that appealed to me was like breaking myself like the first time I always tell everyone the story, the first time I lost $600 playing one, two or one, three at the casino in Edmonton, shout out river Creek casino in Edmonton. <laughs> I sat in the parking lot in like minus 30 degree weather blizzard outside in my car crying because I lost $600 and I kind of needed that. I needed like to get my ass kicked a little bit and stop, you know, obsessing over every penny. Mm-hmm. Uh, and get myself in a place obviously where I'm not struggling so much for money too, which I was for a while too. Sure. So. Yeah, I, uh, I do agree with that. I I actually grew up, um, I grew up, my parents had money and, but they were incredibly thrifty anyway. So that was, that was the, um, you know, my, my dad always held that, the reason he had money is because he, you know, never spent more on anything than he had to. And that, that wasn't really true because he was successful in business and various things, but he, but it, but it is true that like he had more money than other people that might've made the same amount, you know, as him, just because he would, you know, for him, it was all about, you know, not spend, it's not about not spending money, but not spending more than you have to. So that same type of thing with, you know, taking, you know, taking the cheaper flight to do all whatever. And so, and, and but see know, guess, that, that to me, I feel like, uh, and I'm not, there's time, there, 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 there's, there's time, there's time value. No. Like, yeah. So there's, there's the value of your time. There's of the value of like the experience for you to get to your destination faster so that you can you know, either vacation or handle your business mm-hmm. or whatever. And so there's like EV in other places. And that's sure. why it, it drives me nuts when EV is only um, described in a monetary. In, dollar, in dollars. Well, and, and that's, and that's, and I've, I've said that to some extent. He, he actually, I mean, he's still that way in many ways and, and recognizes that. But for him, it's actually um, the EV. It's not even the dollar EV saved. It's actually... It's actually the getting the deal is actually the driving motivator more than anything, to be honest. So it's like that. That's actually there. There is an extent. Uh, there is a that for some people where it's all about that's winning to them is getting a better deal than anybody else got on the same thing or doing whatever. So the deal EV. <laughs> the deal EV is for sure a thing. It's it's the thing for him and it's the thing for my brother-in-law and they're hilarious together, like and whatever. And and I'm. I just, I'm like I said, I'm not super. Motivated. I work with not, someone like that actually. I'm not super money motivated, but I, like, so I don't, I don't need a lot of things for me. I mean, I'm perfectly happy if I just have buy-ins for what I, buy-ins and enough money for a place to stay and whatever. Like I, I, I'm just not, I'm not really driven by having you know, having things or, you know, eating expensive meals or doing anything like that. You're kind that. of like me. I'm just like, I just want to live in a nice, I want to be comfortable. Sure. I want to be I comfortable. I want to live in a nice, I want to come home and be happy when I'm home. But and I, like, then I just want to go to Whole Foods. <laughs> but I like, but I like, but I like cheap bourbon and I like, you know, I like, <laughs> like it's No, I don't like kinda, cheap wine. I like, uh, I mean, well, yeah, I, I, like I, I don't like cheap wine. I don't like cheap wine either. I mean, I, I, I like, I like decent, same thing. I like decent wine, but, uh, but as far as like, like I drink Jim Beam for the most part because I actually like it. Like that's that's just what I've drank for a long time. One thing so. I have to say, quality doesn't mean you have to pay out the ass. For sure. I was telling Adam the last time I spoke with him, I buy filet mignon steaks at Safeway. I make them myself, and sure. it's like thirteen dollars for like a nine ounce steak. Yeah. Uh, Compared and, to yeah, and, and going to like, a restaurant. So yeah. I, 
Yeah, instead of going to a restaurant and then I can buy a bottle of wine for like a third of the price that it is in the restaurant. And like, there's your, you just have to sometimes, I guess I enjoy my own company. So I would prefer sure. to, I've become an introvert and I don't want to leave my house or talk to people. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. And, and like, I think, I think Tito's vodka is always a, a really good example of that. I think I that- vodka. Yeah, but I mean, I'm such a bad Polish. I was gonna say you're, yeah. you're a terrible Polish person. <laughs> you can't do vodka. I I bring shame to family. Yeah, uh, but like no, I think that uh, I think that, like Tito's vodka is a great example of that because it's it's relatively inexpensive, and I think in general most people at this point prefer it to a lot of even more expensive vodkas and stuff like that. And it's just like, and, and vodka is supposed to be like tasteless and odorless. It's not. So, you know, try and try and drink some Smirnoff and something and it'll uh, kind of ruin your whole day some of the time. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's like, like you said, it, it's not all about people do equate, uh, people do equate money to quality in a lot of things that there, there was sort of a, there was a famous story about somebody that had produced a vodka and it wasn't selling very well. And then ultimately uh, they just rebranded it. It was the exact same recipe. They just put a new bottle and uh, upped the price like significantly and it sold much, much better. There's like economic papers on that, on like pricing things properly and like not making them too cheap actually. Right. Because if, if you see something that's cheaper, if you see something that's more inexpensive, your brain automatically says like, oh, okay, well, it's an inferior quality product. Right. And, and some of th- some things are, some things are cheaper, like some things are an inferior product and some of them are just as good, if not better than, than other things. So, I mean, I enjoy a decent cheap cup of coffee compared to like, I don't really like Starbucks very much. Not even that it's more expensive. I, I just, Starbucks. I just don't, I just don't like the taste of it in general. It's so, so bad. It's, I don't understand how it's anyone... like t- it tastes like burnt. Like to me, it, it, it does it taste it tastes burnt, burnt to me too. And I've never understood and- you know why people like it? Because they put a hundred pounds of fucking sugar in each cup. Yeah, that's the thing. Is I drink coffee black, so it's like it's kind of, it's like, you know, I I don't, you know, load it up with sugar or milk or soy milk or whatever the hell people all put into it, and so it's like I just want the coffee and I don't want it to taste burnt, and I also don't, I I also don't like spending you know five or six bucks for a cup of coffee either, when I can you know, get a hundred K cups for. 30 bucks at Sam's or Costco. <laughs> it's like, so it ends up, you know, whatever. But yeah, it's, it's for sure. Uh, there, there is a lot of, there is a lot of separation that has to happen in poker from money just by virtue of doing it. Uh, I have my, my favorite hoodie right now. I just got it on Black Friday. It's uh, from Barstool Sports. It says it's only money. And it's like definitely a, uh, definitely a thing you have to kind of remember with that but it, it's also a good thing that there's a separation for that because for recreational players when they come in and like they put their money down if it was actually their hard-earned cash right in front of them it's a lot different to them than the mental gymnastics that they go through when it's chips instead and all of a sudden it doesn't have the same meaning. you know that's the reason casinos give you chips there's you know there's there's a lot of psychological aspect of that that's just for sure, you know, makes it, makes it seem less like money. Are they actually blowing oxygen at us, though? No, I don't think that's real. I haven't, I haven't been able to confirm that. Maybe that's... I'll get Poppy GTO to investigate. But I, I'm just like, they definitely, really? They, is... they, they definitely keep temperatures extreme on purpose, for sure. And there are a lot of, there's like, there is stuff about, like, the shape the shapes and designs on the carpet shapes that confuse you and keep you in keep you kind of like disoriented and everything like that where you no clocks yeah no clocks no windows anything like that like that's that's all for sure true and then there's like there's smells that they pump in for sure um i did some reading about that there's like there's like these oil things that they put at the base of their like like at the base of their air systems or whatever to pump in a certain smell and that's all yeah, that's all it's all tied like, to like 
Yeah. Mandalay Bay um, has the fucking best smell of any casino out a, there. The worst, oh. is, the worst is Harrah's in Vegas. Oh my god, Harrah's whatever whatever that smell is, it it makes me actually physically sit, like it, it makes my head hurt when I go in there. There's something about like how, and like my clothes smell like it when I mm. leave there and everything like that. So I, I end up. I, I've gotten to the point where I won't even take comp rooms at Harris. I'll just go to either like Bally's or Planet Hollywood or something, just because I cannot handle the the smell of that place. But it's all like it's it's all supposed to be like olfactory memory stuff and whatever, so that you can like remember a big win that you had there, and it brings that back or does whatever. So there's definitely there's there's a lot going on to keep you uh, to keep you gambling and and uh, separate you from as much money as possible. And, and free alcohol helps. It's, it certainly does. That's the shitty thing about a lot of these Midwest stops is it's um, pretty much nowhere here is, is legally allowed to give you free alcohol. And some of the places are smart about it and they just serve really cheap alcohol, but some of them are just like, all right, cool, uh, another way to make money. So they just gouge uh, gouge you on that too. and. Yeah, yeah it's, got, it's like that. It's got gotten to where some of them charge you for bottles of water, and it's like it's just so ridiculous. I think it's like four or five dollars for a bottle of water. At that's Bay that, that, That's absolutely unbelievable. Well, I mean, it's believable because it's because the, the Bay. Bay Area, but it's it's like ridiculous. I mean, I was I was annoyed by I was annoyed by Potawatomi in Milwaukee charging a dollar for like a. 10 ounce aquafina bottle or whatever it's just because like it's a dollar plus you need to give the cocktail waitress a tip so then it's two dollars or whatever and it's just i don't know it's just another it's just more rake it's just another form of rate that they're taking and so i was just like trying to bring as many water bottles in my backpack as i could i'm just like such a cheap asshole but life knit yeah i mean those things add up though at the yeah end of the do you day. keep track of all that stuff I don't keep track to that extent. Um, I keep track of like the travel expenses, the, the gas, the um, hotels when I can't get them comped or Airbnbs or whatever. Um, I keep track of all that just for tax purposes. Um, I haven't put all that stuff together for last year yet, um, but I probably will. I, I most likely will post it all when I do because I said – I said when I posted my end of year results, like that was a thing that a lot of people were curious about. And I try to be like, I try to be pretty open about it. Yeah. You're very transparent. You posted it's pinned right now to your page on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I'll put it up, yeah. but um, you posted your wins, which was just over a hundred K last year. Mm -hmm. um, and that's after um, a lot of people don't consider buy-ins and mm -hmm. that's the negative. Um, do you think that buy-ins should be posted on Hinden Mob? Uh, no, not at all. I think that that's a terrible idea. I think that um, if the only quote-unquote benefit that it has is that it would show people, so, somebody that's like charging way too ridiculous of markup, I mean, like we both know some of those people that are, you see them post something and you kind of just chuckled to yourself, like who's paying that? And it's always, and they always have a follow up post sold out. And it's just like, cause they have a nice handed mob or whatever. They're selling at these egregious markup prices, which was the hot button topic right before. Or overselling. I know people who have oversold. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a whole other thing, but that that's just outright fraud. Like that's, you can, you can do the, you can justify the markup because I think in a lot of those cases, they actually feel that they are worth that. You know, they don't know what their real ROI is or their expected ROI in a certain tournament at a certain time and everything like that. So it's like they can, that is a thing that they can do, whatever. Um, I don't really sell action for much other than like things I sold action for last year were the, were the main event and the 10 K five diamond. So I don't, otherwise mostly, uh, I did a little bit at the beginning of the year. I sold for a couple of 1650s before I had, um, you know, before I had some success and whatever, but it's like, it would be, be it would be beneficial to investors to see what their actual like win rate and all that stuff is. But 
that's not enough of a reason to that's not enough of a reason to do it because recreational players the last thing in the world you want is some guy that makes good money and comes and plays tournaments to see how much he lost last year because I can almost guarantee you I, I, I used to do this little experiment at one two tables uh, I'll, I'll just ask the whole table are you a are you a profitable poker player or are you a winning poker player? I can't remember how I um, had phrased it, but like, I would just ask like, are you a winning poker player? And something like 70 or 80% of people would always say yes. It was very rare. And like the ones that would say no, you kind of like laugh and look at them. And like they're, they probably, they actually probably are. <laughs> like they just don't want to say that. Like they're probably the, the few that are profitable in that game. So it's like, you want them to think that they are profitable or they're break even. That that's the other thing they say. They say I'm break even. Like, so it's like okay, well, if you're either profitable or if all these people are either profitable or break even, how? Where's all this money coming from? Because the house is taking five dollars every hand too. So. So it sounds like it falls under the same umbrella as everyone who think every most people think they're above average drivers. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah. People overestimate their skills and abilities. And maybe I think people are in denial about poker. Sure. Well, because that's a, that's a really big ego driven thing, right? Because poker, it's poker is not a team sport, right? Poker is poker is you versus them and it's a zero sum game. So for every dollar you lost somebody else, won. it's actually a negative sum game because of rake and, mm -hmm. and how, you know, and all that. But even without that, like for every dollar you win, you're taking that off of somebody else. And it's like, there's, there's a lot of ego stuff with that. That's why, you know, it's, it's why dudes in particular will get into, get into these nonstop arguments with each other that the floor has to be called three times. You know, we've all been at a table where the floor has to be called three different fucking times because these guys it doesn't happen in the ladies will not event. stop. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. we just have we have a great time in the yeah world. exactly there you go and so it's just like it's just like a lot of dude ego shit that's going on yeah. with that and so it's like it it ends up being um it ends up being something that you everyone's the hero the thing to remember is everybody's the hero in their own story right that bad interaction that you just had with somebody when they go home and tell everybody all their friends would happen like they look like the reasonable sane one most of the time and you look like the asshole and mm -hmm. like you're probably both somewhat right <laughs> in the situation but but like you know and so that's the same thing like people overestimate their own ability people think that they're and they, and they they need to continue to think that um so, some some recreational players just take it as I have sometimes I have a chance to win a decent amount of money. I'm overall losing, but that's okay because I have fun doing this and I don't mind whatever. But a lot of them really think that they're just like they just run bad, and that's the only reason that they lost. That but that's training. like the it's uh, this is one thing I have a problem with um, that a lot of people go to the mindset of like you have you're gonna have downswings in poker you're just on a downswing and i would say that like a lot of my professional poker friends uh pander to the wrecks mm -hmm. and um i don't even know it feels like sometimes they're not aware of that and so you're having people be... telling you if you're a bad poker player you're having people tell you like it's okay like you couldn't have done anything like it's not your fault you're just running bad it can and it can be it can be predatory for sure like it, but... it and i think the predatory uh it, way the way that it is predatory it varies because it can be mildly predatory i've mm -hmm. seen i got bought into a 1025 game once and i witnessed what i like i couldn't I had to talk to my friends that were all sitting at the table and I could, I was like very upset for a month after this game. Cause I thought it was so predatory versus one whale who is not like now broken out of the game. But, 
um, yeah, I mean, there's different levels of it and like what, what's benign and then what's, what's like, are you, are you seriously trying to make one person broke until they lose their mortgage or lose their home? And it's kind of the reason it's like, so it's like, like ethical boundaries. There, I think there used to be an under, there used to be an understanding about it too. It's why, um, back in the day, all the casinos were all the poker rooms, whatever, were just uh would just spread limit games. They didn't like the pros didn't like no limit being spread because they they thought they would bleed they thought they would bleed their ex dry. Like that they would lose too much money. They didn't want them to they just wanted them to lose right. a little bit every time. But if they came in and lost way too much the thing that those guys don't understand is that is that the Rex are going in in no limit. It's such a swingy game that the Rex are going to have really big wins some of the time too. Like they're going to go on heaters and they're going to have big wins and stuff like that. But you are right. Like there's there is some level of like where it gets to the point of. And so I'm I'm mostly a tournament player. Um, when I play cash, it's mostly it's mostly two five or it's um, or it's one two or one three just to like have a good time and do whatever. I'm I'm not playing one two or one three to like try and pay the bills i mean i think i it, it's, it's pretty tough to beat with the rake and you know with all of it yeah. especially because so many people like short buy and stuff like that so it does get kind of tough like i mean i i i win in those games but you don't make enough money in them to really justify just from an aspect of it's fun and you know it's a, it's a fun thing to drink and play and do all whatever past the time and and do that but so with tournaments, I think it's – with tournaments, it's like that money's already gone, so all you can do is try to get their chips and make them – make sure that they have a good time, right? And I don't I don't go too far out of my way when somebody's like a real big asshole or something to like ignore that and like make them have a good time because kind of they're ruining the time for some of the other recreational mm-hmm. players too and also like – is it really that big of a loss if that guy doesn't come back? But at the same time, in general, like recreational players that play in tournaments with me mostly do have a pretty good time. Like I'm, I'm very, I'm chatty at the table and I'm having fun. I'm not like, and I'm not um, patronizing them the way that some people I think are where they're like, oh, they're, you know, hey, there's nothing you can do there or whatever. If I say there's nothing you can do there, I mean, it's like, it was a shitty spot and I probably would have gone broke in that spot too. Like, I actually mean it if I say that, you know, kind of one of those, you don't have to say something about every single thing or whatever, but at the same time, you know, in general, Rex, Rex tend to have fun with me or they are really annoyed by me because I remember I, too much, I was playing uh I think it was a 510 on live of the bike with Bart Hansen on my left and I when like you fold, when you're folding boats to him no that's a different that was in my game that was a oh, know, that I was know, a I bomb know. pot I know I, I know I know, I know. <laughs> yeah he, so but I remember I like I think I flopped open-ended and um i think i like i didn't have good pot odds to call but i did anyway because i was like in a fucking tilty mood and i was losing all night and i remember looking uh like complaining to bart he's like there's nothing you could have done about that and then he tweeted like two days later anytime someone asked me i just i just say like you say nothing, you, nothing you can do about that anytime <laughs> about, like pandering to the Rex, and i like i text him i'm like fuck you bart <laughs> god damn it yeah Right. You fucking asshole. There's nothing worse than like there's nothing worse than like playing a hand with somebody and then and then seeing it like playing a really shitty hand with somebody and then you later see it like tweeted about or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like that's No, but Bart, uh, Bart's a friend of mine and he's like been um Yeah. He's been like him and I are close and he's been really good to me with this whole puzzle stuff. So Sure. And I you know, I just wanna uh give a shout out to you for being a friend to me even uh during the worst of it and and being supportive and nice. So I really appreciate that. Oh for sure. Like I said, I I think it was I mean uh, the 
from basically the start, it all seemed pretty obvious to me. So I couldn't imagine how it how it got that. Uh, you know, I, I kind of probably came in I a little bit understand. later. I, I came in a little bit later than some people, and I had yeah. no, I had zero attachment to it at all. Right. I can so, understand how people thought like because the video I posted was only like I think four hands, but I can understand how people in a vacuum would think that like sure. oh it's just clicky buttons or like just a, a fish on a heater, but like. But when all the evidence came out, it was obvious. So yeah, of course. No, but yeah, you done. were you were still like nice to me. We were, we've sure. been friendly for a little while, so yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, anything else you wanna you wanna get off your chest? Um, wanna... I don't think so. I think I've, I think I've attacked everybody and every no. Uh, <laughs> no, you do that not... on Twitter. All right, no, that's right. That's my Twitter. Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, um, covered the. Uh, covered i'm gonna obviously out, i'm gonna edit out the part where you got nude and and danced around for thank us. you I'll just I, I appreciate it. nobody nobody wants to see that anyway so i appreciate that i mean there's a there's a niche <laughs> there, there, okay, out there right. that <laughs> i will sell the video but yeah okay that's fair just uh can you blur my face out or something i don't no. know no all right <laughs> um but yeah uh i would say like no i think we covered about everything that i um Oh, other, other than that, I am going to eventually win a tournament. Um, I don't believe you. I just right. like I'm your second that's, and third place cheerleader. That's probably true. I'm uh, I'm actually playing a I'm playing a heads up event tomorrow, which uh, will be fun since I never win heads up ever at uh in <laughs> in live poker, um, and I've even as as you might have seen I changed my Twitter bio to uh, to runner up <laughs> because uh, I, did, <laughs> I did see that. So I'm going to, so I'm going to play a heads up, uh, heads up event tomorrow. So if, if that's the one I finally win, that'll be, uh, I'll feel like that's uh, I feel like that's a lot of indication for all of this, but I'm, I'm most likely going to go out first round because uh, you know, heads up's hard. And I'm no Do you know how it. many, uh, how many people are entering? It's uh it's max 64. I don't think it'll get it. So um, it's max 64. I actually cross booked it with my buddy, which is a terrible idea. He's much better heads up player than I am, but he wanted to do it. So we like cross booked 50% in it. And another buddy texted me and said that somebody told him he could do a last longer, um, but he had to pick somebody other than himself to do it on. So he's like, are you going to play it? I was like, yeah. So he's going to, he did it on. I was like, I don't know if that's such a good idea, man. Like, <laughs> but I will do my best, but yeah, I'm, I'm doing that tomorrow. And then like I said, the, uh, the, by the time this is out, the uh, dealio with uh, bet on drew and poker pastor will probably have already, um, aired but it'll i'm sure be on youtube or something too so uh but yeah that's about it i mean i don't have anything to plug or anything because uh i'm just me <laughs> you can plug your favorite whiskey <laughs> plug my favorite whiskey my favorite cheap my favorite cheap whiskey is is jim beam that's the uh that's the daily uh, the daily cheap one um a little bit better i like i like bullet quite a bit um I like Woodford. Those are all good. But uh but yeah, if it's bourbon I'll pretty much uh if it's bourbon or rye, I'll pretty much drink it. Not too big of a scotch guy myself, but but uh pretty much any of that, so Cool. Well, thank you so much for your time. For sure. And uh I will see you in the Twitter streets. That's and you all. maybe at the World Series of Poker if we don't all die from coronavirus. Yeah, um should we should we set up a booth and sell uh those SARS masks? Uh, yeah, we'll sell masks and you should have eye covers. Mine, I have my eye covers already, but, um, cause it's, I think, um, you have to, it's not, uh, airborne, but it's, um, splash precautions or whatever. Good, Good to yeah, hear. Yeah. So, no, we're all going to die. Last year it was what? Last year it was, I don't know, maybe was that, was that two years ago at the Rio from the water or whatever? There was Legionnaires. There, Legionnaires, yeah, yeah. Legionnaires was a couple of years ago. And no, uh, so, the Rio is like one big Legionnaire like building of successful. billions of bacteria, <laughs> Legionnaire oh, yeah. bacteria. So. For sure. Yes. We're, so, we're, all gonna, uh, we're all gonna die from some variant of Vegas flu, so it is what it is. But we as poker players have the greatest immune systems in the world, so. Yes. No. Yeah. I mean, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> Yeah, because all the dirty chips. People fucking eating after they've touched dirty chips. 
It's real bad. I can't. Real, that uh, that that salad video from the summer was probably the most disgusting thing that I've ever seen in my life. Oh yeah, with their hand, the guy <laughs> eating with his hand. I actually knew that guy. I actually know that guy. He's from Canada. I'm pretty oh, sure. God. That yeah. was that was the grossest thing that I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. I think like that was up there for sure. But, All but right. yeah, see you in Vegas.